What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? So, so let's play a little game this morning, okay? Uh, there's certain things that just seem to go well together, all right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name one thing, and uh, uh, you, you tell me what goes well with that, okay? You'll, uh, you'll catch on in just a second, okay? Cookies and milk. Very good. You're with me, all right? Peanut butter and... All right, man, I really got you with me. Chocolate and vanilla. I tricked you on that one, didn't I? Chocolate and vanilla. All right, I'm going to test how many people are from the north. Meat and potatoes. There we are, northern people. All right, let's see how many uh, Latin folks we have. Rice and? All right, had a little bit more of a response there. Cake and? Ice cream. Spaghetti and? All right, now that you're all hungry, where are we going to go for lunch after church? I kind of whet your appetite just a little bit. Let's try, let's try some people. I'll name some people, all right? Romeo and? Batman and? Sonny and? Tom and? Brian and? Oh, very good. You did well. You did well right there. All right, all of those things and all of those people are better when they are are assisted by something or accompanied by someone else. Here's the simple fact this morning. The simple fact is this. Life is better lived together than living alone. Uh, That truth is clearly seen in the verses that we're studying this morning here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're studying verses that are very well known. As a matter of fact, uh, some of you might have used these verses uh, in your wedding. These are verses that are used uh, uh, during weddings and they're used to show uh, the importance of people being together. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. I'll read, I'm reading out of the NLT. Uh, You follow along in the version that you have. We'll put it up on the screen. Solomon says this, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. Let me pause and and just remember, kind of rehearse in your minds. He's been talking about that meaninglessness, that that futility uh, uh, in the things of life that we experience. And he says, okay, here's another thing. I observed yet another example of something that is meaningless under the sun. And here's what it is. This is the case of a man who is all alone. Uh, Obviously, we could say the case of a woman who is all alone, without child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? Why, it all seems so meaningless and so depressing. So he comes to this conclusion in verse 9. Two people are better off than one, for for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the, the other can reach out and help. But someone who is all alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Then he makes this great statement. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord 
is not easily broken. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we've had today to worship you and to honor you with our, our singing and with our, our worship. Lord, I trust that you've been honored by our fellowship one, with one another. You've told us in the book of 1 John that when we meet together, you're there with us and our fellowship is with one another and truly with you as well. I trust that you've been honored by our worship as we give to you. Because giving is as much an act of worship as anything else that we do. And now, Lord, as we look at your word, I pray that you would teach us. You've promised that you'd give us, that you've given us the Holy Spirit of God, who is our great teacher. And so today we, we sit at your feet, and we want to hear from you. And so I pray that you'd help us to understand these verses. Lord, not only understand them, but to apply them to our lives. Lord, Lord, I pray that all of us would understand the importance of, of living life together. Lord, how together we're stronger. Together we can accomplish more. Together we succeed. So Lord, help us to understand that, but even more than understanding it, help us to apply it to our lives this morning. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll remember that Solomon is involved in a pursuit. Uh, we've called our series The Pursuit. Uh, Solomon is chasing after satisfaction. Uh, Solomon is chasing after meaning to life. He's trying to find meaning. He's, he's trying to find purpose. He's, he's trying to find satisfaction. Yet up to this point, everything that he has pursued has all turned out to be futile. It's turned out to be worthless. It's turned out to be meaningless. You'll remember we've already studied that, that he chased after wisdom, and, and we saw that Solomon by far was one of, if not the wisest man that has ever lived, and yet he realized that, that wisdom, as great as it is, doesn't provide satisfaction. It doesn't provide meaning. Why, he pursued pleasure, and we talked about how many wives he had, and, and the hobbies that he had, and the buildings that he did, and yet he came to the same conclusion. Why, it's meaningless. It doesn't provide purpose. He talked about wealth, and my oh my, maybe the richest man that had ever lived. We talked about that he brought in close to a billion dollars a year in gold and silver. He had everything he wanted at his fingertips. And yet he said, that too is worthless. And then he talked about success. And he said, all of these things arrive at the same conclusion. None of them gives me what I am searching for. In the verses that we just read, he finds something else that proves to be meaningless. Something else that is futile. And he talks about being alone. Now, as we read through these verses, you probably noticed it, but the word alone is mentioned three times in these six verses. Notice in verse 8, uh, Solomon says, this is the case of the man who is all alone. Verse 10, he says, but someone who falls alone all by themselves is in real trouble. And then in verse 11, he says, but how can someone be warm alone? <laughs> Like everything else that he pursued before, Solomon comes to the conclusion, he says, man, being alone is a bummer. Man, it's, it's not what it's cracked up to be. Now, we can certainly relate with Solomon or relate with what Solomon is saying. Loneliness is becoming more and more of an issue in the United States. I'm not, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this or not, but our country is now being characterized as the lonely nation. Not because we're all by ourselves and no other nations want to come alongside of us. The idea is not we're lonely in comparison to other nations. The idea is that we are lonely in comparison to ourselves. More and more we are isolating ourselves from each other. And we're becoming more and more lonely. You know that there are more people living alone in the United States today 
than in any other time in the history of our country. Uh, We no longer interact with our neighbors. If I asked you, many of you, I guarantee you, might not even know the names of your neighbors. Man, we we see each other when we drive out of our driveways and we kind of wave, but but there's no interaction. We need another hurricane, don't we? Something to kind of bond us together in our communities. Maybe we don't need another hurricane. Everybody say, Brian, please do not say that, all right? We need something to bond us together. It's easier to send a text message today than it is to pick up the phone and call somebody. Even at church, even in God's house, It's easier for us to come in, sit somewhere away from everyone else, and not get connected with anyone. They say that's one of the reasons for the mega church movement. People can walk in, they can sit there, they can enjoy the service, and they can leave and not have to interact with anyone. Why we are doing that more and more. The question is, though, is that healthy or is that unhealthy? Uh, How does God view that? Well, the simple truth is this. Life is better lived together. Together, we are happier. Together, we are stronger. Together, we can accomplish so much more. Together. God is pleased. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is found in Psalm 133 in verse 1 that says this, How wonderful, how pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. Now certainly it's not talking about all of us living together. We're not going to tell you to sell your house, bring your stuff, and let's all live together in this building. That's not what we're talking about today. But we're talking about living life together. Probably my, my favorite author was a German pastor that lived during the Second World War. If you've never read anything about him, I'd encourage you to read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he's a man that certainly understood sacrifice. He's a man that, that understood convictions and, and wasn't afraid to live and to die for his convictions, which he did under the hands of Adolf Hitler. But he wrote a book, a great book, one of my favorite little books called Life Together. And, and he talks about the importance of, of believers living life together, how that encourages us, how that strengthens us, and how that helps us to become stronger in our spiritual lives. He made this statement. He made a lot of statements that I could use, but he made this one. The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. Is that the case in your life? Is the physical presence of other believers in your life a source of of joy, a source of strength? Why? A source of victory in your life. That's what Solomon is talking about in the verses that we're studying this morning. So uh, what does Solomon teach us? What does Solomon tell us about living life Together. Let me mention a couple of things, not real deep today, but extremely practical for each and every one of us. The first thing that Solomon uh, recognizes is this, God designed us to be together. God, God designed us, God made us social creatures. God made us social animals. God designed us, he created us, he formed us for the purpose of being together together. Uh, In verse 8, Solomon made this statement. He says, this is the case of the man who is all alone. Now, think with me this morning. Combating loneliness is not just a numbers game. You know as well as I do, if you're lonely, the answer is just to go in the mall or to go to the mall and be around as many people as you possibly can. You can be in the midst of hundreds, even thousands of people and still be what? All alone to still be lonely. So combating loneliness is not just a numbers game. Just putting people around us does not cure loneliness. Quite frankly, that might have been the case for Solomon. 
Although Solomon had servants and soldiers and spouses that surrounded him, it's very possible that Solomon felt lonely even though he was surrounded by multitudes of people. No doubt he experienced what he was writing about and there were times in his life when he felt all alone. And as he writes his testimony here in Ecclesiastes, he understands how depressing that is, how discouraging that is. Why? How much we need each other. Being alone is not how God intended for us to live. Let me show you another verse, a verse that you're familiar with that clearly demonstrates God's desire for us to be together. Put your fingers here in Ecclesiastes 4 and go all the way back with me to Genesis chapter 2. All the way in the beginning there when, uh, when God was, was creating earth and, and everything that we know and God was creating us, God, God made a great profound statement that describes you and describes me. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Let me put that that verse in context and we'll understand it because because I get a chuckle out of the story. I kind of have a weird sense of humor, you know that. And as I read through the Bible, I get a lot of humor out of the Bible. And so as I read through the events of Genesis chapter 2, it kind of makes me smile just a little bit, and I kind of laugh. You might not get it like I get it, but, but, but here's what's taking place. Uh, God had created the earth, and God had created the plants, and God had created the animals, and God had created Adam, and God had placed Adam there in the Garden of Eden, and so God gives Adam this very important task, and he says, Adam, here's what I want you to do. Big responsibility. I want you to name the animals. Can you name the animals? Lord, I think I can do this, all right? Adam, I know you've only been created for a couple of days and your vocabulary's not big. You think you can do that. Okay, Lord, I think I can do that. And so God says, I'm gonna bring the animals in front of you and you are to name them. Got it, okay, here we go. Let's start. So here comes two really large animals in front of Adam with great big ears. And Adam's like, okay, Uh, Dumbo, no, we're not going to name them Dumbo, elephants, we're going to name them elephants. And so he names the elephants, elephants. Now, I know he probably didn't speak English, but, but, but humor me just a little bit this morning, okay? And then as he walks through the garden, he sees uh, two lions lying there. And so he says, lions, we're going to call them lions. They're lying there, we're going to call them, I'm not sure if that's what happened or not, you know? He sees, he sees these other cat-like creatures with spots all over him, and he says, hey, I'm going to call those leopards. And he sees others that are similar, but they're different. And he says, uh, I'm going to call those cheetahs. Do you ever wonder where he came up with the name cheetah for those? I was wondering if maybe he was eating a bag of Cheetos when he did that and just kind of changed, I don't know. He sees these two primates that are swinging on a tree and, and he names them monkeys. And so Adam goes through and he names the animals. Now, now here's what the text says that's really interesting, that, that, that God brought those animals to Adam's in, or, or to Adam in pairs. The, the elephant came and the elephant had his or her partner. And so the lion comes, and the lion had a partner as well. And, uh, and the cheetah has a partner, the leopard has a partner, the monkey has a partner. They came to Adam in partners, and verse 20, as Adam is naming the animals, verse 20 of Genesis 2 says this, but there still was no helper just right for him. So, so, so do you see the light click on in Adam's mind? Man, The elephant, man, look how happy he is. He's got a partner, and uh, man, the lion, look how happy the lion and lioness are. Man, they're together, and and man, the monkey's even got a partner. And why? I am all alone. There's no match for me. And it was in that context that God said in verse 18, it's not good that man should be alone. And the Bible says that God created a 
helper for him. You know the rest of the story. God took a rib from Adam's side and God created Eve who became his helper, his helpmeet. The term is a very interesting word. It means counterpart. It means the other side. It speaks of fulfilling the void in his life, providing the companionship that Adam so desperately needed. God says it's not good that man should be alone. God wanted man to be what? To be together. And so God created somebody that he put Adam together with. Now, applying that back in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, here's what Solomon is saying, and, and here's, I believe, a truth that's applicable to each and every one of us. Togetherness provides companionship. Togetherness provides companionship. In today's passage, Solomon mentions child or brother. Of course, he could have added wife or friend or or neighbor. He could have used uh, any title. And the idea that Solomon is saying is this. Why? Man is all alone. Where are his companions? Maybe it's a personal testimony. Where are my companions? I realize it's not good for me to be alone. So so let me just ask you a question this morning. With whom are you close? With whom do you share those most intimate moments of your life? Who do you laugh with? Who do you spend time with? Who, in whose company do you enjoy being in? God made you that way. And God made me that way. He brought us together for the purpose of companionship. You ought to look at the person beside you and say, I'm so glad that you're in my life. Can you do that right now? Now, even if you don't know the person, look at them and say, I'm so glad that you're in my life. All right, because God put them in your life today. God brought us together for the purpose of companionship. Boy, people are waving to each other. I like that. People are looking 10 rows back. I'm glad you're in my life. Huh? There's a second thing that Solomon mentions. Togetherness not only provides companionship, but togetherness provides purpose as well. Uh, Notice what he says in in verse 8. He says, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can, but then asks himself, who in the world am I looking for or working for? I I am all alone. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, man, it's, it's important to have people in your life because those people in your life define your life. Those people in your life give you purpose. Those people in your life motivate you. Those people in your life help you get up every morning. They give you purpose. Here's what Solomon is saying. Life is meant to be shared. Uh, wealth is meant to be shared. It's not meant to be hoarded. I mean, I mean, who makes so much, puts it in their pockets, and then realize, I have nobody in my life with whom I can spend what I'm making. That's what Solomon says. It is our family. It is our friends that often provide purpose and meaning to our lives. Apart from God, they are the ones that motivate us to do what we do. We live to provide for them. We live to love them. We live to point them to Jesus. Here's what Solomon says in real simple terms. Life was not meant to be lived alone. God designed us to be together. There's a second thing that we see in that passage, and I want you to notice this. The second thing he says is this, life together is for our benefit. Uh, Here in the passage, Solomon mentions three illustrations of how friends benefit from one another. And if I asked you to give testimonials this morning, I'm sure, man, you could mention all kinds of ways that, that you benefit from your friendships and from your other relationships. Solomon mentions three. Let's just look at them briefly this morning. Solomon says, first of all, that a friend provides assistance 
from harm. No, notice verses 9 and 10. He says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Why, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is what? Is in real trouble. Man, Solomon is saying, man, you need somebody in your life that will assist you, that will keep you from harm. Man, man, there's two ways that we can apply that. The first is the most obvious, all right? You need somebody in your life that will help you when you fall physically. Uh, can you remember a time that you fell down? Uh, I mean, whether you slipped, whether you broke a leg, whether you broke an ankle, sometime you fell down and you needed someone to lift you up. Do you remember that? Vicky always tells the time. I was, uh, when we were dating, I wasn't the, you know, the sharpest tool in the shed, and I wasn't the kindest. I wasn't the most romantic. And, and we were in Bible college, and, and we went to one of those real strict colleges that we weren't allowed to touch. You know, you couldn't hold hands. You couldn't, you couldn't touch each other. So we're walking through. We're walking, was it, where were we walking through? The chapel? Or walking through someplace in the chapel? And Vicky slips and falls. And in her typical self, she's laying on the ground laughing at herself, just absolutely giggling and laughing. And I'm scared to death. I can't reach down and touch her because, God forbid, boys weren't allowed to touch girls. And so I didn't want to reach down and touch her. So I'm standing over here saying, get up, get up, Vicky, get up. Come on, get up. I don't know whether I should reach down. I'm just saying, come on, Vicky, get up. I was of no assistance to her that day. It's amazing that she's still not there on the ground because I didn't help her at all. Aren't you glad that there's people in your life that when, they, when you physically fall, they're there to pick you up? All of us can think of friends in our life that, that, that have been there for us. When we needed them, they were there for us. We needed them to lift us up, and they did it. That's what friends do. Remember the, the, the song that Dionne Warwick sang? That's what friends are for. That's what Solomon is talking about. That's what friends are for. Man, when we fall, we pick each other up. You see, that type of friend will assist you when you fall physically. But I cannot believe that there's not a spiritual application here as well. Because a, fr because a real friend will not only assist you when you fall physically, but a real friend will assist you when you fall spiritually as well. How should we respond when a friend of ours falls into sin? How do we respond when someone that we love does something that they should not do? Do we abandon them? Do we criticize them? How do we respond to them? Paul gives us some instruction. Let me show you a verse. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul tells us how to respond. Galatians 6, 1, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly put that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You see, as brothers and sisters, when whether one of us fall, Man, we're there to help pick them up. We're there to help encourage them. Here's what Solomon says. A friend provides assistance from harm. Notice the second example that he gives. He says, secondly, a friend provides warmth from the cold. Uh, in verse 11, he says, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? Man, they got this maybe more during Old Testament times than we understand it today, because if we happen to go up north where it's cold, we get in our cars and we turn the heater on. We have all these machines that help to keep us warm. During Old Testament times, they didn't have that. Travelers that were exposed to the elements quickly realized the importance of sharing body heat. Lying close together kept them warm. I don't know whether Vicki remembers when our oldest son Justin played soccer. Uh, we were living up in Northeast Ohio and there would be games. I remember that one game we were at where Justin was playing soccer and it was like 40 degrees and it was raining and we're sitting in the stands. You know, you're wanting to go home. It's like, I don't think I love my son enough to be here during this game. And so, but you know, you got to stay. And so we got blankets and we're sitting in the stands and, and we're trying to get as close to each other as we possibly could. Why? We were freezing to death. 
and we were trying to keep each other warm. That's what Solomon is talking about. Friends do that. Friends provide warmth, both physical and emotional. Do you ever walk in a room, and it might not be physically cold, but you ever walk in a room and like everybody is unbelievably cold to you? And you walk in, nobody says hi to you, nobody greets you. I mean, you feel the social freeze in the room. And then all of a sudden, you see a friendly face. You see someone you know, and you all of a sudden feel what? You feel comfortable. Their presence warmed you up. Solomon talks about that. The third example that Solomon gives is that a friend provides protection from evil. Verse 12 says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. The application is obvious. Alone, a person is vulnerable. Alone, a person is susceptible to attack. It is the presence of another that provides protection. And we've illustrated that here a variety of ways in the past. If you remember, remember, remember the video we showed a few years ago of the little water buffalo that was all alone and was attacked by lions. And then all of a sudden the herd comes back and protects that little water buffalo. What's the idea? Man, there is strength in unity. We've illustrated it by taking one page of a phone book, and when that page is all by itself, you can rip that one page very easily. But when you put hundreds of pages together, what happens? There's strength in unity. Together, we're protected. Alone, we are vulnerable to attack. Alone, we are susceptible. That's what Solomon is saying. We desperately need each other other. The story is told of Jackie Robinson. If you're a baseball fan, you're familiar with Jackie Robinson. Even if you aren't, you're probably familiar with Jackie Robinson, the first African-American to play Major League Baseball. Uh, Jackie Robinson was the one who broke the color barrier, and, and it was rough. He would go from stadium to stadium, and he would be heckled. He would be heckled even in his own stadium there in Brooklyn, and, and, and one day while, while playing uh, in the game, Jackie Robinson committed an error on his home field there in Brooklyn, and his own, stand, his own fans began to boo him and jeer him and mock him and make fun of him. <laughs> Jackie Robinson says that he stood there humiliated in front of all of those thousands of fans, and all of a sudden, his friend, the shortstop, Pee Wee Reese, little guy, walks over to Jackie Robinson and in front of all of those fans, puts his arm around Jackie Robinson. There's a memorial that shows it. And Pee Wee Reese demonstrated his friendship for Jackie Robinson when everybody else was booing him and cheering him and mocking him. Jackie Robinson said, that one act saved my career. What Pee Wee Reese did, just that simple act of demonstrating friendship, saved Jackie Robinson's career. Uh, let me ask you this morning, what type of a friend are you? Are, are you that kind of a friend? There are many verses in the Bible that talk about friendship. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born in help, uh, to help in a time of need. Romans 12, 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Let's make a commitment to be that kind of a friend, to be committed to those that are in our life when they fall physically or spiritually. Let me show you a third thing, and I'm done today. The third thing is this, life together is even better in groups. Now, I want you to see what Solomon does here. Solomon gives us just a little bit of Bible math in the passage, all right? First of all, he talks about the futility of one. Don't be caught alone, he says. He then addresses the advantages of two. With two, man, they assist you from harm. They keep you warm. They protect you from evil, but then he concludes with the power of three. Now, notice how he concludes verse 12. He says, three are even better. 
for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Talks about one of those ropes that had three different threads that were braided together. Now, ropes were very important during Solomon's day. Why? They fastened tents. They secured animals. They, they bound prisoners. Here's what Solomon is saying. He is speaking about a bond that is not easily broken. And he uses that analogy in reference to relationships. He says, if one friend provides protection, warmth, and support, how much more will you receive with another or with additional friends? Now, now this verse is applied two ways. Give me just a couple of minutes. It's applied two ways. Two great applications that I want us to think about and, and chew on today and apply to our lives. The first is this. This is a beautiful illustration of covenant marriage. As a matter of fact, maybe in your wedding, in weddings that that you have seen and participated in, you've heard this verse read, a a three-folded cord, a a triple-braided cord is not easily broken. It's talking about covenant marriage, and and that's a great Bible term that we're going to talk a lot about in the weeks to come because that is so important. A covenant is defined as a solemn binding or, or, or a solemn binding agreement between two individuals. A covenant marriage is deeper than a simple agreement. It's just not, okay, you love me, I love you, hey, let's get together. No, a covenant marriage is so much deeper. It is a deep promise of commitment regardless of what happens and that commitment always remains unbroken you say okay Brian how does this apply and how does that work how do we apply this to marriage simple mathematical formula let me give it to you in your outline today it's God plus you plus your spouse equals a threefold cord let me say it again God plus you, plus your spouse, equals a three-fold cord. God needs to be a part of the marriage equation. God needs to play an active role in your marriage. Can I get an amen somewhere in the congregation? God needs to play an active role. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 127, 1, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers are working in vain. God needs to be a part of your marriage. Husbands, God needs to be a part of your life. Wives, God needs to be a part of your life. Why? Because if not, you do not have that strong cord that will endure the struggles, the trials, the tribulations, the fights, the kids, the economic struggles. You need God in your life to help you survive. How does that happen, Brian? Well, each spouse needs to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Together, you must recognize his leadership in the home and put him first. The Bible must be the guide for your decisions. Hey, let's be honest. Life puts strains on marriage, does it not? Anybody agree with me? Three of us? Life puts strains. Nobody else is brave enough to admit it. Life puts strains on a marriage. In our case, I I give you strains that's been in our marriage. We spent 10 years living in another country. That's difficult on a marriage. God gave us, he wonderfully gave us a disabled child that puts strains on a marriage. Vicki and I are here to tell you that as much as I love this woman and I adore this woman and I worship this woman, Were it not for God, we would not be together. If God wasn't involved in the equation, if we were trying to do it on our own, we simply could not have made it. We need God in our relationship. And so do you. A threefold cord, God plus you and your spouse, is not easily broken. This passage applies to marriages. Covenant marriage is not 50-50. Covenant marriage is 110-110. 
Covenant marriage is based on unconditional promises. It contains steadfast love. Covenant marriage is a view that commitments are permanent. Let me give you a second thing. I know my time is done. Covenant marriage reflects the relationship that Christ has with the church. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives just as life, just as God loved the church. Is God a part of your marriage? Husbands, do you love your wife and treat your wife as Christ loves and treats the church? Does your marriage reflect Jesus? There's another application. I'm going to give it to you in a minute, and I'm done. All right? This verse not only beautifully describes marriage, but it also, it also powerfully illustrates Christian fellowship. It illustrates the fact that we need each other. The idea of two or three people meeting together in the name of Jesus it is a New Testament concept. It illustrates the beauty of unity, the force behind Christian friendships, the need, let me be bold, the need for small groups. In the beginning of the message, we spoke about our tendency to isolate, our tendency to just barely be a part of. Listen, we need each other. We don't do life groups just so it's something else that we do in our church. We do them because I need them and you need them. I need the participation of other believers in my life and so do you. We all need that in our life. Three things, Christian fellowship offers encouragement, I'll give them to you quickly. Christian fellowship offers accountability. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the accountant of his friend. Men, you need somebody in your life that's going to ask you the hard questions. Ladies, you need somebody in your life that you're going to be accountable to. That's why small groups are so important. Christian fellowship results in spiritual growth. Listen, we say all the time, real growth doesn't take place here. Real growth takes place when we live Life together. When we live together. Solomon says, you're by yourself. You're all alone. There's power in two. There's power in three. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Let me challenge you. If you're not involved in a life group, why are you not involved in a life group? You need to be. We want to challenge you to be. There's literature in the back that has all of our life groups. We make it easy for you. Sunday morning, during the week, anytime during the week, find yourself a group of people that will push you to be who God wants you to be. One of the things that I struggle with as a pastor is seeing casualties in ministry. I see people that come and people that go. And statistics say that those who stay are the ones who get tied in. Those who become part that learn to live life together. 